Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for the big 4-0, the 40th anniversary of the Mises Institute. Uh, I think it's incredible. Um, it's a great honor to be presenting, uh, leading the, 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 the lineup. When I think of all the tremendous progress the country has made over the past 40 years, I mean, we just think about it. In 1981, the uh, average inflation rate was 9%, and now it's down to 8.3%. So that's, I mean, that's change you can believe in, right? Yeah. And I, 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 it, again, as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a great honor to be speaking at this event and, and, and leading uh, the, the, today's lineup of speakers. So uh, at least there's no pressure on me, right? If I, if I don't do good. Um, and if you guys are bored of my presentation, I have good news. It's, it's going to be transitory. So it will only, <laughs> it'll only last for a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to talk today about public enemy number one, according to the uh, Austrian School of Economics. And that, of course, is the, the Federal Reserve, the, the, the big bad wolf, right? So I want to spend a little bit of time uh, discussing the Fed, discussing where the Fed's been over the past couple years, what the Fed has predicted would happen, what's actually happened, what the Austrian School would say would happen, and so on. Because this is a really important time to be knowledgeable about monetary policy, uh, which is probably why the Federal Reserve has tried its very best to make everyone uh, not very knowledgeable about monetary policy. So instead, I want to uh, clear the, con the confusion out of the room and, and just get to the basics as to uh, why we are where we are today. All right. So I want to look at the Fed's report card over the past couple years. I am a professor, so I am a grader. I, I have to you know, give out progress uh, reports and, and suggest room for improvement. And you know the Fed was recently riding very, very high after after COVID. It was seen as doing a great job at solving the economic crisis that we were in. Uh, you know, in 2019, what I like to call the before times, right? So the period before COVID, um, unemployment was at 3.6%. Right. Fairly low. That was partially due to demographic uh, trends, but that was about the modern natural rate of unemployment. Inflation, as measured by the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, was 2.2 percent, so right about target, a 2 percent inflation target. And uh, GDP was uh, growing uh, fine. It was the past two quarters, GDP growth had averaged about 1.3 percent, so very. Uh, very good report card in, in, in 2019. So let's fast forward to September 2022. The unemployment rate is 3.7%. I don't know if you've seen the news today. The new jobs report came out. The unemployment rate is actually about 3.5%. Uh, and you can see for various reasons that I'll uh, get into why stocks have been doing so poorly today after there was a false hope at the beginning of the week. So unemployment, it's about the same. Uh, Inflation's at about 8.3%, right? So that's, that's not good, okay? That's, that's, that's about six percentage points above target, right? And to add insult to injury, uh, GDP the past two quarters has been declining by about 0.6 percentage points. So normally, if you read an economics textbook, which apparently is supposed to uh, contain the knowledge that we, we, we teach students, it, Two consecutive quarters of declining real GDP is a recession, but we're not in a recession. We might be in a technical recession or a recession declared in a month or so or two months or so for various reasons that I'll, I'll get into. So th th this is an F. Uh, I, I would give the, the report card in September 22 an F. Uh, the, the Fed has, has clearly done something wrong. Uh, we're right back where we were with unemployment, but inflation is, is raging and economic growth has been contracting. So this is, this is very clearly a uh, see me after class, uh, come to office hours perhaps for tutoring, and I'm going to draw, I'll have to draw some supply and demand graphs using money supply and money demand. So the, the, the Fed has, has, has been doing something wrong. Um, maybe they were taking uh, online classes <laughs> over the uh, past couple, couple of years. Um, so, so um, all right, well, what, what, what exactly is, is, is going on? Uh, so what, what caused the, the, the inflation? If you talk to a Keynesian, it's going to be supply shocks. We've seen this ad nauseum over and over again, the supply chain bottlenecks and snarled supply chains. There's shortages of computer chips. There's high food prices. Uh, this is Putin's price hike 
so we've been told, uh, so on and so forth. And while this isn't to deny that there have been uh, some negative supply shocks over the past couple of years, this is, it, it's, it's far too narrow. It can explain a couple of isolated price increases, but not much more beyond that. And if we go to a different school of thought, the, the, the Reichian school of thought, led by uh, Robert Reich, uh, this is due to corporate greed. There apparently was this huge burst of corporate greed over the past two years as all these monopolistic, blood-sucking companies uh, decided to bilk the consumer. Apparently, they were very altruistic in the 2010s, and then all of a sudden, there was this huge burst of corporate greed. And while I'm not one to deny that there's been increased consolidation in industry over the past couple of years, I would point out that this is due to the regressive lockdown policies we've practiced. And even then, the, the, this can only explain some price increases, or it's really more of a reflection, a symptom of the underlying cause. So what would the Austrians say? Uh, what, 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 what explanation would the Austrians give for our current malaise? Right, and, and I tried to find as, as scientific a, of a graph as possible to explain the, the Austrian perspective on this. <laughs> And this is what I came up with, right? It, it's, it's, uh, it's not exactly Noah's Ark, but it's, it's close enough. Uh, you've got uh, our Fed chair, Jay Powell. His money is, is raining down. Uh, it's a, it's a, a veritable flood of money, and that's exactly what he's done. This, this former partner, one of the uh, lar Wall Street's largest private equity firms, has flooded <laughs> Wall Street and the rest of the economy with money, right? Over the past two years, or really in 2020 and 2021, the money supply increased by 40%, okay, 40%, right, the big four zero. Okay, we haven't seen a two-year uh, increase in the money supply of that magnitude in modern American history. It's really unparalleled, right? Spending has gone up. Nominal spending of just people using this excess money and buying goods and services has increased by about 16% over the past uh, several years, and this is far above average. Okay, so spending's gone up. You print a bunch of money, people are going to go spend it, so spending's gone up 16%. And consumer prices during this time have gone up 15%. Okay, that, ma that makes sense, right? Uh, now, now, why is no one talking about this? If you read articles, you might now occasionally hear about expansionary monetary policy, but you, you don't really get into the, 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 the actual process. Or no one talks about the money supply. The Fed doesn't even talk about the money supply. The Fed doesn't even publish money, uh, excuse me, target the money supply, and they changed how they publish uh, monetary aggregates during COVID. So this is really the giant elephant in the room that the Austrian school has, has really been the only school of thought talking about. There have been some monetarists, to their credit, have been arguing that this large increase in the money supply would raise prices, but their actual theoretical analysis is, is quite different from the Austrians, and uh, especially regarding their business cycle analysis, which I hope to get into a little bit later in my talk. But it, it, it's really that simple. It was the Fed printed a tremendous amount of money, and this was very different than during uh, the financial crisis, how the Federal Reserve printed this money, how it was injected into the economy. There were many economists arguing in 2020, you print all this money, you're going to get inflation, but no one is focused on that. The Fed, it was seen as having everything under control. And when price rises started to occur, we all started to hear that T word. It was transitory. It was transitory. It'll be gone by the end of the summer. And boy, have they been wrong at that right? It's not transitory. It's looking to be quite permanent, right? So <laughs> this, is, this is part of the issue why the Fed has failed on its report card. It, it forgot how monetary policy works. It either forgot or it lied. Uh, you know, certainly both of those explanations uh, are, 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 can, can explain the current environment we are in, right? So as Austrians like to point out, there's something else that can happen when the money supply is increased, and that's that interest rates fall. So there's a huge drop in interest rates that we've seen over the past uh, several years uh, with this 40% increase in the money supply. The federal funds rate is at 0%. Uh, 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 the interest rate on corporate debt is at 2%. It's the, the lowest it's been uh, over the past 60 years. Mortgage rates were at uh, 2%, a huge drop. So as Austrians, we know that this increase in the money supply, this new credit, artificially lowers interest rates. And this stimulates the 
uh, the, the long-term investments. So it, it stimulates uh, corporate borrowing. Corporate debt has surged. Uh, combination with the prior decade of already low interest rates, corporate debt as a percentage of GDP has uh, increased from 40% to 50% over the past 10 years, tremendous amount of, of, of debt. And these low interest rates have encouraged borrowing and long-term investments. So we all remember at the beginning of, of 2021 when there was a huge uh, speculation, everyone's got their, their, their stimmies, right? their stimulus checks, uh, people were buying the meme stocks, AMC, uh, the price of which skyrocketed 720% in 2021. Massive increases. Uh, cryptocurrency experienced a similar boom. Bitcoin's price went from about $10,000 in, in the fall of 20, uh, 2020 to up to $60,000, a little bit over $60,000 in mid-2021. People were buying assets with uh, you know, the, the, with the value that what they were willing to pay was much greater than their, their fundamental value according to actual economic fundamentals. To, to, to give an, another example, uh, last year in, in St. Petersburg, uh, about 200 or so odd people bought uh, copies of a history book on uh, special interest policies, spending $20, $30 on it, even though its underlying value is $0. So it was, uh, this is it clearly the, the interest rates are starting to start starting to affect even even the Austrians. But so we've seen huge speculation, various um, uh, investments, higher order investments uh, were, were embarked upon, e-commerce, artificial intelligence. Now, undeniably, some of this was encouraged by COVID and the COVID lockdowns, but. A lot of this was driven by artificially low interest rates. Lower interest rates increased the present value of stocks. The NASDAQ in 2020 and 2021 was, was on a, a veritable tear. It increased by about 63% during this time period. And all of these wonderful investments, people were saying it's going to be the new roaring 20s. All of these um, investments in, relating to driverless vehicles, artificial intelligence regarding e-commerce, uh, you know, phone apps, et cetera, all of this boomed. The FANG stocks, the big tech companies experienced uh, huge uh, increases in, in, in production and in um, um, uh, market value during this time period. And then, of course, there's residential real estate. Right? Home prices in 2021 increased by 17% very large increase. In 2021, 1 1.6 million homes were constructed. That was the most out of any year since 2006. Right? Mortgage rates, as I mentioned, were, were very, very low, 2% or even lower. A lot of people were, were buying homes again. You started to see another, another housing bubble uh, form, or at least that's what some of the more astute people realized. Other people said, no, this is, this is normal. This is, interest rates aren't going to change. This, is, this isn't going to be a problem. So, only the Austrians really pointed this out, okay, that if you increase the money supply, it will not only cause inflation, but it will cause a distortion in the structure of production. The economy will unsustainably lengthen. You're going to have a boom-bust cycle, right? So the important thing, as the Austrians point out, is that these investments are, are malinvestments. They are bad investments. They're not based off of underlying economic fundamentals. Okay. A lot of people thought that, well, during the lockdowns, people had saved a tremendous amount of money. Right? You had this, so this huge increase in savings, and in reality, that was just a nominal illusion. Right? People started to spend that money, and the savings rate declined. The savings rate fell uh, during this time period, 2019 to 2022, from 9% to 3%. Uh, we were getting back to the levels right before the housing crisis, and in fact, we're now below that. People weren't saving, right? In fact, this money, the people spending this money uh, was not because prices were rising, it was causing the rising prices, right? We, we know this. This is, again, simple Austrian economics that the media, uh, the Federal Reserve, and mainstream economists did not want to talk about. So as the economy was adjusting as if people were saving more, people were saving less. This is, this is a recipe for disaster. And we started to see a so-called tug of war among the various stages of production between the short-term investments and the long-term investments as scarce factors, the prices of which were bid up. We saw labor shortages, shortages of other factors of production. Uh, producer prices rose 35% during this time period. So in comparison to the 15% rise in consumer prices, producer prices were rising. 
Austrians would explain this as saying, well, there's a, there's a credit boom in the making. Okay? Uh, factors of production are being bid up. Uh, they're being bid up more than was what expected. And we're going to start to see prices uh, rise. So the fact that producer prices were rising more than consumer prices is certainly something that, at least at this magnitude, should have caused people to, to, be, to be worried about. Right? So prices were going up, consumer prices were going up, producer prices were going up, people weren't saving as much. What's that going to lead to? Well, you're going to see more people borrowing. Businesses and consumers keep borrowing more. In fact, mid-2021 to mid-2022, bank loans increased by 13%. We haven't seen those numbers since before the financial crisis. This is really a textbook case of, 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 of um, Austrian a bubble in the making, right? We, we flood the market with cheap credit. Businesses embark upon uh, projects as if there's more savings in the economy, right? but there aren't more savings. So producer prices rise, businesses have to keep borrowing more, consumers start to indebt themselves, they start to get into more and more debt. So consumers are getting in more debt, businesses are getting in more debt, and of course we can't forget that Uncle Sam has been getting in more debt. I don't know if anyone saw the headline earlier this week, I think Jim Grant mentioned it, $31 trillion is our national debt. I mean, that's the national debt we'll talk about. It's actually much larger than that, but you know, we'll just say, okay, it's $31 trillion. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. And $31 trillion in interest rates are rising. That's, that, that's not good. Okay, it's also not good for people who have an adjustable rate mortgage or businesses who've been borrowing on the short term. That's not good. Right? So interest rates have been rising, and this is in combination with the Federal Reserve starting to raise interest rates, 75 basis points over the past several months, and the federal funds rate went from 0% to 3%. So there's a huge pressure on interest rates. Right? Interest rates have been starting to go up. And the funny thing is, there's still a lot of room for interest rates to go up. People are saying interest rates have already risen enough, but when you adjust for inflation, they're still a little less negative. Okay? Um, so here's the bust. I, I don't mean to depress anyone, uh, but if I do, that means I'm, I'm doing a good job. This is the uh, S&P adjusted for inflation. So everyone, I'm sure, has been watching their 401ks melt away over the past year. I have news for you. It's actually worse than what's been reported because you're not taking into consideration that prices have also gone up by 8% during this time period. So all the increase in prosperity we thought that happened in 2020 and 2021 35% rise in the S&P uh, during this time period, quite, quite large in 2021, phenomenal year for the stock market, has, has gone away. It's about a 29% fall, and this isn't taking consideration, this is at least earlier uh, in the week, right? So it's, we're, we're basically back to where we were in December 2019. Judging by the stock market, we've made no progress. There's been no accumulation of wealth, right? You haven't earned anything in, in, your, in your average investment account, uh, and real wages, of course, haven't gone up. They've fallen by about 3%. So this is, uh, th th this is certainly problematic. And we're starting to see these problems appear. From boom to gloom, tech recruiters struggle to find work. Right, so the, the, the once mighty tech industry, which was benefiting from this uh, huge credit-induced bubble, is now struggling. We're starting to see concentrated layoffs in these higher-order industries. Uh, home prices now posting biggest monthly drop since 2009. Oh, that's good news. Um, the, 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 the home market, which was seen as impregnable, is now suffering. If you're a seller on the market, things aren't looking good. Even if you're a buyer, the mortgage rates are approaching 7%. Uh, we haven't seen uh, interest rates that high for, for a residential loans since the housing crisis. Uh, this is a problem. There's a, there's a lot of problems starting to, to, to brew, the, the bust, as the Austrians predict, and the Federal Reserve did not predict is, is looking more and more like a reality. That soft landing that we were promised the, is, is, is becoming, it, it's, it's, not looking, it's not looking so good now, right? Uh, it was basically all an illusion over the past couple of years. So let's look at where we can go from here, right? What's the path forward? What comes next? Scenario one is that the Federal Reserve tightens vigorously, keeps raising the federal funds rate. They were already late to the game. They should have been raising rates in uh, the, early 2021 at the, uh, at the very least, especially by late 2021, not starting really in mid-2022. 
they should keep raising the federal funds rate. The federal funds rate has to actually be positive, which is adjusted for inflation, is, is certainly much higher than what it is now. At over, it's got to be at least, you know, around at least 7 to 8 percent at, 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 at the very least. Uh, this, of course, would cause uh, the boom to end. But we would take the pain now, and inflation would go down. Okay? Uh, this would be the path if we were to follow the, the depression of 1919 to 1921 which I think is actually a fairly accurate description of what's going on now, at least with the, the boom. So this is if the Federal Reserve does what it's supposed to do. Uh, I highly doubt that will be the case. Uh, the Fed has been pumping in tremendous amounts of money in 2021 and then really kind of been sluggish in 2022 because of the midterms. And at least this is my, my argument. I still think this holds true. They've got one more meeting before the midterms. There's a lot that could change. New GDP data, whatever. The Fed is posturing to be an inflation hawk. But will they? I, I, I doubt it. And even if they raise by another 75 basis points, I still don't really think that's enough for what they should have done before, uh, at least during, during 2022. There's just too much government business and consumer debt. Borrowing costs are starting to go up. And this is starting to impose incredible strains. I don't know if anyone's looked at the stock market recently, but it's very clear that Wall Street is jonesing for a rate cut. They're kind of coming across as, as more of a, a heroin addict. At the slightest news, the Fed's going to raise rates. Stocks go up. We saw this earlier in the week. We, everyone got happy with the, the uh, Bank of Australia uh, raising rates less, less than expected. And then reality comes back. They're not going to get their fix. And then we see stocks fall and start, Wall Street's starting to realize that, well, in high interest rates, they're, gonna, they're here to stay. They're going to keep staying. They're going to keep getting higher and they're going to stay for longer than we expected. So this, this is certainly a problem and this is going to pose a lot of pressure on businesses, consumers and government uh, that have been borrowing on the short term. This is, this, this is, this, this, this is an issue. OK, so that's scenario one. Scenario two is that the Fed tightens slowly or it pivots, the so-called Fed pivot, right, where it will stop raising interest rates as high as it's been raising and keep them at a level and then maybe cut. Wall Street's still overly optimistic that by the end of 2023, uh, the Federal Reserve will cut rates. And this is going to give plenty of time for the excess money to be spent. We still could see price rises increase because there's still a tremendous amount of excess cash balances. And consumers, businesses, and governments that have all this new money will then keep spending it out. Uh, prices will keep rising. Uh, inflation uh, could keep rising. The total rise in prices could go beyond 15%, could go to 20 30%, etc. And this is even with the monetary indicators currently flatlined. We, there is money demand. It's not just money supply. And this would cause inflation to be, uh, to be entrenched, um, permanent decline in the stock market and real wages. We could see something like stagflation, right? these alternating periods of low growth, um, uh, so these periods of low growth, high inflation, uh, gr you know, high unemployment. We could say gradually rising uh, uh, unemployment. Uh, governments are going to be very, very concerned about raising interest rates too much because this is going to put incredible pressure on the amount of indebted businesses, governments, and consumers going on right now. I unfortunately think that's the more likely scenario. All right. I would like to be wrong, but I could see this problem lasting for a couple more years. All right. We can either take the pain now or we could get rid of it. Uh, or excuse me, we take the pain now or we could just uh, let it slowly go away sort of grinding inflation. All right. So the Fed caused the inflation, and the Fed caused the inevitable recession. This much we do know from Austrian uh, economics. And past and present, the Austrian school has exposed central banks. We've really been the only school to, to really do this with, 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 with such vigor and to expose it in every which way. Austrians aren't saying, oh, the Fed raised interest rates too much. And that's what caused the recession. The Austrians said, no, the recession begins when the Fed starts lowering interest rates. This is very important, right? And Austrians have to keep doing this because if not us, who else? If there wasn't the Austrian School of Economics, the Fed wouldn't have been exposed over the past year or two. So Austrians have to keep doing this. And we have to keep doing this, and we have to remember the motto that, that Mises said, which is, do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly against it. 
And that's what Austrian economists need to do when criticizing the Federal Reserve and other central banks. So I think I will end there. So thank you so much. And I look forward to the rest of the, the event. So thank you. Thank you.